Good morning. Good to see each of you here on a Labor Day weekend. And uh, trust that you'll have a great time together with maybe family or friends. But we're glad that you're here to spend a few moments in seeking God and worshiping Him and praising Him and allowing Him to speak in to our lives. I do, let me, let me just ask you a question. How many of you know someone that isn't in church this morning? Not this church, but maybe any church. Huh? You know someone? Will you invite them to come with you to church next Sunday? You know people that aren't in church. And um, as we start off our, our fall schedule, I encourage you to think of those people and, and invite them to come. And don't just invite them to come, but invite them to come with you, to sit with you and to, to come and to, to be here and experience uh, worship together. And hopefully they will become a person that seeks God and has a relationship with him. And so we just encourage you to, to use those, the tool of two service times to be able to invite people that maybe aren't here and maybe haven't been invited and just need someone to invite them to come. This morning we're finishing up our, our study of the Sermon on the Mount and we haven't done the whole sermon. It's three chapters here and um, we're still in chapter 5. But we went through the Beatitudes and then into the beginning of Jesus fleshing out how do we live out the demands of Christ in the situations that we find ourselves in. And um, this morning we're um, taking one of the topics that he uh, shared with those that he was preaching to. And um, we're going to take... Uh, the, the, the passage from Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37. To set that up, I'm going to read a couple verses of scriptures that aren't from here, but sets up the question. I have the question there for our topic this morning, who is your daddy? Who is your daddy? Well, these verses deal with our topic, which is on speaking the truth. And here's what John says. John says, for you are the children of your father, the devil. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Children of the devil the father of lies. The other side is this. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. And Paul said, so that no one can criticize you, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So who's your daddy? Satan the father of lies, or are you children of God, the God who it is impossible for him to lie, and he calls us to be like him? So that's kind of the broader picture of where we're going this morning. Let me ask you another question. Could you function if you always had to tell the truth? Before you are quick to answer that, think about that. If you had to tell the truth in every situation, could you function? Let's look at a few things. Sometimes we don't tell the truth to cover ourselves. A wealthy businessman, he lay on his deathbed, and his preacher came to visit and talked to him about how God could heal, and he prayed over this parishioner. And when the preacher was done praying, the businessman said there, laying on his deathbed, Preacher, if God heals me, I'm going to give the church a million dollars. 
Well, miraculously, the businessman got better, and in a few short weeks, he was out of the hospital, and several months had passed, and the preacher bumped into this businessman on the street of their town, and he spoke to him, and he said, you know, when you were in the hospital dying, you promised to give the church a million dollars if you got well. We haven't received that yet. And the businessman replied, did I say that? I guess that just goes to show how sick I was. Then sometimes we lie justifying it by saying we're really protecting others. Joe had to go to Chicago and on a business trip and he persuaded his brother to take care of his cat. And his brother hated cats, but he agreed to do it. And when Joe got back and he was still at the airport, he gives his brother a call to check up on his cat. And when he said, uh, hey, Joe, how's my cat? He said, "Um, your cat died. And he just hung up. And and Joe was inconsolable and, 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 you know, his grief over his cat was, was intensified because of the insensitivity of his brother. And so he calls him back up and he says, there's no need of you to be so blunt. Well, he said, well, what was I supposed to say? He said, well, you could have told me the news gradually. You could have said, well, like the cat was playing on the roof and, and then later in the conversation you might have said, well, he fell off and, and he broke his leg. And, and then when I came to pick him up, maybe you could say, well, I'm sorry, but your cat passed away during the night. You've got to learn to be more tactful. He said, by the way, how's mom? After a long pause, he said, well, she was playing on the roof. How do we evade the truth? Sometimes we think we're off the hook because we have a technicality. Once there were two brothers. They were very rich, but they were also very wicked. They lived their lives in sinfulness and debauchery and used their wealth to cover up their wickedness. And both were members of a local church. And they used their money to to have positions of influence. And the old preacher that was a preacher of that church had retired and they had a new preacher. And the congregation began to grow and, and, and uh, they were needing a new building and so they were planning on a new building. And about that one time, one of the brothers died, got sick and died. And so this new preacher was asked to preach the funeral. And so the day before the funeral service, The surviving brother pulls the preacher aside and hands him an envelope. And he said, preacher, he said, in that envelope is a check that is large enough to pay off the whole building. All I want you to do is to tell the people at the funeral tomorrow that my brother is a saint. He said, do you think you can handle that? And the preacher shook the brother's hand and said, yep, I think I can do that. I'll do exactly what you asked. And so the preacher took the check, put it in the bank account of the church, and the next day he stood in front of a large group of people at the funeral, and this is what he said. The man in this coffin was an ungodly sinner. He was wicked to the core. He was unfaithful to his wife. He abused his children. He was ruthless in business. He was a hypocrite at church. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. (laughs) If we lie, sooner or later, we're going to get caught. Like a young Navy sailor who was sent to Japan to be stationed for a year. And when he left, his fiancée gave him a harmonica. And she said, I want you to learn to play this harmonica while you're gone. Doing that will keep your mind off of those Japanese girls. And so she would, he would write her and tell her how he was practicing his harmonica every night. Well, after a year, 
he comes home. She meets him at the airport, and, and uh, he grabs her and, and pulls her in for a kiss, but she pushes back and says, wait, before you kiss me, play the harmonica. I don't know whether he was able to play it or not, but he was put to the test. A few years ago, there was a, a, a couple men who wrote a book based on thousands of interviews that they had done here in the, in the uh, USA. And of those surveyed, this is what they found. 91% of people that were surveyed in this, in this, uh, for this book said that they lie in some way regularly. 86% said they lie to their parents. 75% said they have lied to their friends. 69% say they lied to their spouse. And 50% of them said they regularly called into work sick when they weren't. Let's look at the verse of Scripture in Jesus' message that deals with this matter of truthfulness. He said, You have also heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say to you, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. Do not say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple, yes I will, or no I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. I don't think it was coincidental that these verses come right on the heels of a uh, previous verses that Jesus was speaking about adultery and about divorce. And he re reveals here some, some important reasons why we must live truthfully. The truth is, truthfulness, or the lack thereof, affects our relationships. When we disguise the truth, when we think that we can get the upper hand by saying something not quite truthful or, or get the advantage by saying something that's just a little shaded, we end up abusing people. We end up disappointing people. We end up, for the sake of our own interests, destroying relationships. When we lie and we don't keep our promises, it destroys trust uh, in those relationships that we have in our lives. No doubt, maybe as children, your parents stress to you that you should always tell the truth. However, there are times that we may find ourselves uh, thinking like the little boy who when he was asked what was a lie, he replied, a lie is an abomination to the Lord, but a very present help in times of trouble. And that's many times how we look at these things. Yeah, we know it's wrong, uh, but if we're in a fix, then uh, we, you know, it helps us get out of those situations. But being a follower of Christ, being a Christ follower, is a commitment to truth. And we need to be people of our word. If there are anybody in Clearfield County that should be people of their word, uh, it is us as followers of Christ. We should be known as someone who keeps the promises they make no matter what. And so I challenge you this morning in three things. The first is, keep your promises even when they're in seem insignificant. When we start to justify a little dishonesty in our life because what it, it, it's just kind of insignificant, it's no big deal. We have to be careful because we're one step closer to doing things that we never thought we would ever do. The little areas test our integrity. God takes stretching the truth seriously. 
Every time even a casual commitment is broken, damage is done. Have you ever heard maybe just little common, common lies like this? Someone says, honestly, I only need five minutes. Or you're sitting down, your table will be ready in just a minute. The check is in the mail. We service what we sell. If elected, I promise. (laughs) There was a busload of politicians. They were headed to a convention and because of highway construction, they had to take a detour through a rural area. And the driver's was ha- driver was having problems on that country road and, and he lost control of the bus and he crashed uh, into a farmer's field and turned the bus over. The old farmer was on his way to town and noticed what was happened there and he saw and he went to investigate it and he looked and he saw what had happened and so he went back and got a shovel out of the truck. And he buried all those politicians. And since the politicians never arrived uh, at their destination, a state trooper was sent to find out where they were, and he backtracked, found out that they had to take this road, and went down there, saw the bus, and looked at for the farmer, and found the farmer, and the trooper asked him, where had all the politicians gone? And he told him, he said, I buried them. And he said, you did what? You didn't call a coroner? After all, some of them might not have been dead. And the old farmer says, well, some of them kept saying that, but you know how politicians lie. (laughs) We might be familiar with those kind of lies, politicians, in our culture. But there are other lies that destroy integrity too. We lie to cover up our mistakes. We exaggerate the point. We mislead. We give false flattery because of trying to ingratiate ourselves with someone. We deceive, we cheat. Most of the time, just to make ourselves look better. If I could have a dollar for every time someone told me that they were going to be in church on Sunday, I'd have a pretty nice nest egg of those that said they'd be here but never showed up. There was a preacher that told everyone that next Sunday's sermon was Joshua chapter 25. He wanted everybody to read it for next Sunday. And Sunday came and he just asked, how many read the chapter that I told you to read? And Hands went up all over the congregation. And the preacher said, everyone that didn't raise your hand, you're free to go. This morning we're preaching about lying. There's only 24 chapters in the the book of Joshua. Rodney Buchanan wrote this. He said, who has not been startled to hear yourself say something that is an exaggeration without even thinking about it? It is not that you began the conversation with intention of saying something that was not quite true, but before you knew it, you found yourself embellishing the story. Are you honest about your age? Have you been thoroughly honest with your taxes? Have you been dishonest about the time you claimed you worked or not given an honest day's work or an, for an honest day's pay? Have we ever cheated on a test? Have we ever lied to get out of trouble? Have you ever complimented someone when we didn't mean it at all? Have you kept silent when you knew the truth? Made yourself appear better than you really were? Lied to get an advantage in the situation. Paul says this, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. 
The second thing is, keep your promises even when you regret making them. Maybe you regret making a promise because things didn't turn out the way that you hoped that they would. Maybe it takes more time, more effort, more money, more knowledge, more energy than what you thought at the time. And you made a promise. And you thought maybe you would get something in return, but now that isn't working out. Uh, You're not getting anything. Maybe sometimes you make a promise that you don't like. But God wants us to fulfill it because of our integrity. Maybe we regret that promise. But God states the righteous keep their promises even when it hurts. C.S. Lewis, uh, the great Christian scholar and writer, in his biography he tells of suffering that he endured because of a promise that he kept. When he was in World War I, one of his buddies and him were talking and his buddy was so concerned because he had a wife and child at, at home and he, what if I get killed? And he made a promise to him there, if anything happens to you and I live, I will take care of your wife. I will look after them. And as the war dragged on, his buddy was indeed killed. And true to his word, Lewis took care of his friend's family. And yet, no matter how much he helped that woman, the woman was ungrateful, she was rude, she was arrogant, she was domineering. And through it all, Lewis kept on forgiving her. He refused to let her actions become an excuse to renege on the promise that he made to that friend. Sometimes we make promises to our Lord. And we stand and we say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. And I'll put him first in every area of my life. We like the Savior part that he saves us, but the Lord part in which he's going to be first, we find that so hard and difficult uh, to, to, to follow through on. And we begin to let other things slip into that important slot and other things begin to crowd him out. Uh, Dr. Seuss, in his book, Horton Hatches an Egg, the elephant Horton promises to sit on the egg of the, it's the egg's mother, Miss Maisie. And days and weeks go by, and Horton just keeps sitting on that nest up in the tree. And his friends come along and encourage him to forget his promise, uh, to come play with them, to, to, to leave what he had promised Miss Maisie that he would do. And his response was this, I meant what I said, I said what I meant, an elephant is faithful 100%. What could God do with a congregation of people that had that kind of commitment to their promises to him? Keep your promises. Keep your promises. And then keeping your promise even when you're the only one who knows. When you keep a promise to yourself, you're going to tell the truth to others. Promises to ourselves are sometimes the hardest promises to keep. There's no one keeping us accountable, and many times no consequences if we break our promises because no one knows. But what, once we start breaking promises to ourselves, uh, it becomes easier to break promises to others. Jesus makes it clear here in chapter 5 that when we make a promise, we do it in the presence of God. 
It's not what anybody else thinks, it's what God has heard when we make those promises. Uh, and when we break a promise, we're not just lying to others, we're not just lying to ourselves, but we're lying to God. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees, as we talked about a couple Sundays ago with their laws, made all kind of technicalities and refining them to the, so that they could work around them. And they had all kind of ways to get out of these things. And Jesus addressed some of them. He said, if you swear by Jerusalem, if you swear by Jerusalem in the Jewish context, uh, you were bound by that because it was a holy city. But if you just swore towards Jerusalem, then you didn't have to keep that promise. If someone thought they heard you swear by Jerusalem, but you just swore towards Jerusalem, that was a technicality that could get you off the hook. Any promise that had God's name in it, you were bound by it, but if somehow you made the promise and in speaking to the guy, you never said God's name, then you weren't technically bound by it. And we could look at some of those and say, well, that's silly. But don't we have similar ways to get out of it? Well, I cross my heart and hope to die. Cross my fingers. We swear on a stack of Bibles. What if I didn't swear on the Bible? Does that give me an out? We make all kind of ways to guarantee that what we're saying is truth. May lightning strike me if I'm not telling the truth. I swear on my mother's grave with God as my... All kind of things to, okay, if I said that, then it's really true. But Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. There's no need of that if we are really Christ followers. He says, don't swear at all, or don't take those kind of oaths. Some people have tried to make this passage to just be about not taking an oath. Uh, but if that's all it is, they were no better than the Pharisees to just say, okay, I don't take an oath. What Jesus really is talking about is truthfulness. Speak the truth. Always speak the truth. God takes lying very seriously. And you say, well, how do you know? Well, listen to what the word says. The Lord hates liars, but is pleased with those who keep their word. In Revelation, it says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. This is what God says about lying. So how do, I, how do I keep my promises? Well, the first thing I have to do, I have to admit that it's a struggle. We all struggle, I think, to some degree with this issue of truth because Jesus ultimately said, I am the truth. And all of us struggle to put Jesus in his proper place in our life. Uh, sometimes it just seems easier to tell that fib. When we're not people of our word, uh, we can do some dangerously terrible things to our witness. We can damage the cause of Christ. People are looking for authenticity, especially in people who claim to be Christ followers. So admit that truthfulness is sometimes a struggle and recognize that Jesus says no matter what, tell the truth. And so I admit, okay, I've got to work on this. I've got to look in any areas of my life where I'm not as truthful as I should be. And then monitor your promise. Can other people count on you to follow through and do what you say? Have you ever said, I'll pray for you? And then never get around to doing that? I'll have to admit that's, that's an area that I struggle with because so many times people say something and I'll say, I'll pray for you, and then later I'll think, I never did. I never, got a, I never wrote it down or I never... Sometimes we do say things just because it sounds like that's what I should do or should say. Eugene Peterson in his paraphrase of our text said it this way. Don't say anything you don't mean. 
The council is embedded deep, this council is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you and never doing it, or saying, God be with you and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. Just say yes and no. It sounds simple enough, and yet we know speaking the truth is anything but simple. And then third, examine your motives. What do I really want? Why am I making this promise? Do I want what I want no matter what it costs me? Do I want acceptance even if it means uh, being less than truthful? Someone wrote, the test of character comes when being truthful endangers what you want. Living an honest life, keeping our promises is is a difficult thing. Uh, There were some heroes in the Bible that This was an area that they struggled in. Abraham went down into Egypt, and there he lied to Pharaoh about his wife, Sarah. He said it wasn't his wife, it was sister, because he was afraid because of her stunning beauty that Pharaoh might take her and kill him. And so he allowed Sarah to be taken Jacob lied to his father Isaac, saying that he was actually his brother Esau, and he went through all the deceit of putting goat hair on him and going out and and getting a meal prepared and trying to get a blessing that was for the oldest son. Uh, Peter lied to the servants and to the soldiers surrounding the fire as Jesus was on his way to a trial. He said there at the fire when they said, aren't you one of them? And he said, I tell you, I never even knew this man. And for each of them, there was a price that was paid. However, the Holy Spirit uh, is a God uh, uh, of forgiveness, and he convicts us, and he changes. He wants to change our our lives uh, and to change a liar into a person of integrity. Abraham came to the point in his life of trusting God to the point when God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, and take him to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. He got up early the next morning and began that journey. Jacob, after a night of wrestling with God, was able to trust him with everything that he had and returned to face his brother Esau, whom he had cheated and betrayed. Peter was able to trust God before the very same crowd uh, in which he had denied him uh, and began to preach uh, on the day of Pentecost and proclaim uh, the name of Jesus Christ, the name that he had denied just 50 days before. Christ calls us to a life of profound truthfulness. We live in a radically deceptive world a world that is deceptive at its very core. And we are adrift in a, in a, in a, in a sea of, of, of deception. The media, the culture, it's constantly trying to deceive us. It's not easy to be a truthful person in today's world, but it's necessary if we are to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The world longs for truth. And the sad truth is that many people who have taken the name of Jesus and call themselves Christians uh, have no better ethics and morals than the culture in which we swim. However, when people know that you don't lie, your testimony will have so much more effect than any theology that you may share with them. Paul said in Corinthians, he said, You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Rid yourself of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put 
on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Solomon said in Proverbs, there are six things the Lord hates, seven which are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. In fact, he repeated lying twice in that list. In the book of Revelation, this is what it says. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and the 24 elders. No one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever he goes. They have been purchased from among the people of the earth as a special offering to, the God, to God and to the Lamb. They have told no lies. They are without blame. Our whole sermon could maybe be summed up in these words. God hates lying. Always tell the truth. Have you told the truth? The whole truth? Nothing but the truth? God honors simple honesty. Back in the 18th century, the the king of Prussia, King Frederick the Great, visited one of his prisons. And as he came in, one prisoner after another came up to him to convince the monarch that they were innocent, that they were in this jail unjustifiably. And amazing, he heard every kind of excuse you can think of of people that were unjustly punished for crimes they never committed. Except for one man who the whole time he was there sat over in the corner of his cell. And while all of these stories were unfolding, he never said a word. And seeing him sitting there, he asked that he be brought over to him, and he brought him over, and he asked the man why he was in prison. And he said, armed robbery, your honor. And the king said, well, were you guilty? He said, yes, sir, without hesitating without any excuses. King Frederick then gave the guard an order. He said, release this guilty man. I don't want him corrupting all these innocent people. (laughs) Part of telling the truth begins with telling God the truth about who we are. And that's where we have to start admitting who we are, admitting our struggle, admitting our sin. As the publican stood before God, he, he just humbled his heart and said, God, be merciful, be merciful to me, a sinner. And when we humble ourselves before God, we find the forgiveness of God and the forgiveness of God that transforms our lives. This is an area of our life, and to degrees, as I said, probably we all struggle with it in some way. This is where we need to humble ourselves and say, God, help me to be a person of the truth. When we're a person of the truth, we're a person of Christ, for Christ said, I am the truth. And as he lives in our heart, truth lives in our heart, and there's no room for lies. This affects every area of our life, our relationships, our work, how we live in our community, with our neighbors. What kind of person am I? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. It is impossible for God to lie. Satan is the father of all lies. Who is your daddy? Who is your daddy based upon the truthfulness in your life. Shall we stand? Would you bow your heads with me? No one looking around. Just between you and 
and God. Is this an area that you struggle with and you admit? And would just raise your hand and say, Bob, as we close in prayer, I want to pray too, just right where we are. God, help me to be a person of the truth. Anyone just put your hand up real quick. I see those hands all over the congregation. God, help me to be people that are truthful in every area. Father God, we bow our hearts before you this morning and we thank you for the word of God. Lord, sometimes it's not easy to swallow as we look at ourselves and see areas in which we have need, but Lord, you reveal it to us not to burden us, not to knock us down, but to give us hope. And Lord, this morning, help us to put our hope in you. Help us to trust in you. Help us to confess to you and to receive from you the gift of transformation. That in this area of our life, we will be people that are unequivocal. That we are be people that there's no room to wiggle here. And if we find ourselves wiggling, we ask that you would convict us so that we will be more willing to submit to your lordship than ever before. <laughs> Father, I pray for each person that raised their hand and in their heart, I pray this week you would begin to, to work a work in, in just revealing to them the areas of need and, and revealing to them how to be truthful in each and every situation. Father, help us to be men and women of integrity in our community, that people know that the people of this church are people that are honest and keep their word. Help us to be followers of Jesus Christ. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.